Hello, my name is Leon Menezes. I'm a consultant radiologist and a nuclear medicine physician at the Institute of Nuclear Medicine at UCL and here in the Bart's Heart Centre. This series of talks from the British Nuclear Cardiology Society we've recorded is to give you the basic grounding in nuclear cardiology, the applications, the technology and the evidence. We hope you find them interesting and useful. Hello, my name is Rebecca Schofield and I'm part of the British Nuclear Cardiology Society. I'm a consultant cardiologist uh, and I work in North West Anglia Foundation Trust. I'm delighted to be helping provide some of the educational content on the new BNCS YouTube channel. So for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to cover the topic of mycardial stunning viability and hibernation. Before we start, I would just like to thank the many contributors to this uh, presentation and also uh, acknowledge the research in this area and some of the main contributors uh, internationally. So the objectives of this session are just to go through some of the definitions and terminology because it can get quite confusing, look at the background as to how this topic became of interest and why it still is of interest and in intrigue. Uh, we're going to cover some of the different imaging uh, modalities which are used clinically to assess for uh, stunning and hibernation and then following revascularization to assess viability and then we're going to look at some of the current uh, fairly heterogeneous trial data which is available to us. So the concepts of stunned and hibernating myocardium uh, were described back in the 1970s and 80s and these phenomena are related to myocardial ischemia. So with severe and prolonged myocardial ischemia there is myocardial necrosis and unfortunately no return for contractile fun function. Hence the, hence the old adage of time is muscle and the uh, strategies that have been put in place uh, for early revascularization in acute MI. Following full and complete revascularization uh, and reperfusion, uh, there can still be a transient post ischemic LV dysfunction, which is termed stunned myocardium. Chronic low blood flow or repetitive episodes of myocardial stunning and consequent metabolic adaptation will over time lead to hibernating myocardium. So this is defined as contractile abnormalities and cellular abnormalities which occur uh, as a result of uh, chronic uh, ischemia. So in 1982, Bromwell and Klonner first described this concept of myocardial stunning. And what they described was stunning as prolonged post-ischemic ventricular dysfunction, which will occur after brief periods of non-lethal ischemia. So what they, they thought of this concept of myocardial stunning as a hit, so an episode of ischemia, hence the baseball player, a run, so the relief of ischemia, and then a stun, a longer period of uh, post-ischemic left ventricular contractile dysfunction. And the cardiac muscle will eventually recover, but during this phase of impaired function, it may require inotopic, inotopic support. Stun myocardium uh, is also associated with prolonged biochemical abnormalities that can take days and weeks to resolve after the uh, initial insult of ischemia. And we see clinical evidence of myocardial stunning on a daily basis in uh, acute cardiology uh, inpatient care. So we see patients following revascularization still having regional wall motion abnormalities. We see uh, regional wall motion abnormalities in patients with uh, ischemic uh, chest pain presenting to us with unstable angina. And we can see prolonged but eventually reversible improvements um, in LV function following revascularization and cardiac surgery. And then more recently we've become aware of conditions such as stress or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, neurogenic stunned myocardium in those cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, dialysis related ventricular dysfunction. But this story starts quite some time ago 
So back in the 1970s and 80s, there was a lot of lab-based research looking at the effect of ischemia on myocardium. And a lot of these were animal experiments uh, where there was occlusion of a major coronary artery for uh, periods of time, uh, followed by reperfusion. Depending on the duration of the ischemia, they could see largely reversible injury versus more prolonged ischemia leading to myocardial necrosis. Regional wall motion abnormalities in a lot of these studies was measured with ultrasound or with uh, radioactive isotopes um, and assessment of the blood pool to determine LV function. And what was observed is that the myocardium that was being perfused by the occluded artery became akinetic or dyskinetic during the period of ischemia, but when blood flow was restored by removing the coronary artery clamp or ligation, contractile function remained depressed. So even in the context of then restored perfusion, myocardial function did not immediately return to normal. However, they observed that they generally did so over the course of a few days. In addition to the imaging assessment of myocardial function, uh, researchers also looked at cardiac ATP levels, and these also demonstrated biochemical stunning, and levels were depressed within 15 minutes of coronary artery occlusion, but gradually recovered towards normal by 72 hours. Histological analysis revealed myocardial cells were viable at 72 hours post-perfusion. And many, many laboratories around the world independently demonstrated this phenomenon we now know as stunned myocardium. Stunning being linked to brief periods of ischemia was not associated with the histological evidence of myocardial necrosis and cell death. Other studies showed that this phenomenon occurred in models of myocardial infarction with a salvaged outer wall of the ventricle. And in this case, the recovery of function following reperfusion of these experimental MI models was even more prolonged, requiring days to weeks. Clober's research group also showed that contractile function of stunned myocardium could be supported in the initial phase with inotropes and that this use of inotropic support did not result in any long-term uh, delirious de uh, detrimental effects such as extending infarct size. There was dis dispute or debate about the concepts of myocardial stunning versus hibernation, but notably repetitive episodes of myocardial stunning can cause chronic hibernation. The term hibernation is a retrospective definition based on evidence of functional recovery after an intervention. So according to these original descriptions, hibernation is reduced myocardial function in the context of reduced regional myocardial perfusion, whereas stunned myocardium is reduced myocardial function in the context of normal perfusion. So what causes myocardial stunning? Well, there are several clinical conditions, inflammatory diseases such as myocarditis and coronary vasculitis, anything that can lead to coronary artery occlusion, so obviously acute coronary syndromes, uh, but coronary anomalies, coronary vasospasm, uh, embolic MIs. There can be other causes, so post um, uh, cardiac arrest or hemodialysis or post um, cardiopulmonary bypass, and then there's a different group of adrenergic-mediated catecholamine release syndromes, which include uh, Takitsubo, the neurogenic stunned myocardium, Cushing's, phacromocytoma, uh, carbon monoxide toxicity, cocaine abuse. Independent of the clinical cause, the pathophysiology and final common pathway of uh, reduce myocardial responsiveness uh, to calcium remains the same. Myocardial ischemia may lead to uh, the release of reactive oxygen species, free radical initiated reactions that lead then to protein denaturation and enzyme inactivation, 
and then ischemia can also promote the intracellular calcium concentration and these direct effects of altered calcium homeostasis in the ischemic myocardial tissue uh, then results in a reduction in the excitation contractile coupling and reduced myocardial function. So just to recap, stunned myocardium is a result of acute ischemia with initially a reduction in perfusion and function, but following relief of ischemia, there's restored perfusion, complete viability, and no infarction, but the area that had been ischemic remains um, hypokinetic. In hibernating myocardium, this is a chronic condition which results in long-term reduction in myocardial perfusion, which in turn reduces the regional myocardial function, but the myocardium remains viable. <clears throat> so, again, back in the 1980s, this idea that the heart could uh, protect itself, uh, this smart heart hypothesis was first discussed. So in the context of low blood flow or reduced oxygen supply, supply there was an adaptive uh, down regulation of function. So this was a homeostatic um, attempt to counter the reduced perfusion uh, and it could even prevent ischemia and it could certainly prevent painful ischemia which may explain why patients uh, didn't present in the same way, but instead with, with uh, heart failure symptoms. So just to, just to reiterate the point. So what happened next? So over the next 20 years, there was lots of additional trial evidence then in patient populations using different imaging modalities to uh, ascertain whether or not the myocardium uh, was viable, uh, was indeed hibernating, and there would be some improvement in uh, contractile reserve and myocardial function following revascularization. The difficulty with many of these trials is their heterogeneity, both in terms of patient selection, the imaging modalities used, and what exactly they were telling us about the myocardium, and then also the primary and secondary endpoints of the trials. So what's, what's new? What has changed? Well, I think the controversy around the issue of uh, myocardial hibernation and whether or not it was due to uh, just a chronically reduced uh, coronary flow or whether it could be caused by uh, repeated episodes of ischemia and stunning which they had validated in the animal models I think this, this question is now resolved and that there's agreement that both uh, situations so both chronic reduction but multiple repeated episodes of ischemia can both lead to myocardial hypernation. And we know a bit more now about what's happening on the cellular level so there's been a lot more uh, work from a basic science point of view and there's uh, again consensus that the um, histological phenotype if you like of myocardial hibernation uh, is, is, is characterised by glycogen deposition, mycelic cellular hypertrophy, apoptosis, uh, myofibrillar loss and increased expression of ischemia responsive proteins and cytokines. Interestingly, this idea that there is a dichotomy between ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and that only in ischemic cardiomyopathy can these... Uh, areas of interest such as hibernation and stunning occur, perhaps we've, we've oversimplified that. So there's actually a, a crossover in terms of the cellular expression uh, and what's happening on the cellular level between um, ischemia and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. 
And I suppose this is again goes back to this issue which uh, all nuclear cardiologists are very much aware of that there is uh, a rich network of uh, myocardial capillaries which extends uh, above and beyond the epicardial coronary arteries. So these changes do occur over time as myocytes reduce in number and more fibrosis uh, is laid down, uh, the worse the situation is and the less likely uh, it is that there will be meaningful improvement in myocardial function following revascularization. So we'll move on to some of the clinical imaging uh, methods which are used for assessing uh, myocardial viability. So the advancements of diagnostic imaging has really enabled the identification of changes in the myocardial tissue and cardiac kinetics um, to be demonstrated and help really further the understanding of the pathophysiological features of sun myocardium. What we need to appreciate here is that yes, there are many different techniques for assessing viability, but each has uh, strengths and weaknesses, and each is perhaps telling us something slightly different. In echocardiography, uh, often the use of resting regional wall motion abnormalities and the severity of those, uh, coupled with the wall thickness, so a wall thickness, uh, and the same is true here in cardiac MR, a wall thickness of uh, more than six millimeters. Uh, would suggest that there is evidence of viability. We can also with echo see fibrosis and scar, we can see uh, um, areas of uh, aneurysmal dilatation, you get a flavour of the chronicity of the infarct by echo. We can also then use uh, dobutamine specifically to assess uh, the inotropic and contractile reserve and there are some centres uh, which will use myocardial contrast to assess perfusion. And this is an area that I'm afraid I have very little uh, understanding or experience with. But we do use dobutamine stress echo fairly routinely. And what you're trying to demonstrate is that with low dose dobutamine, uh, you can see some improvement in myocardial function so that you're demonstrating a contractile reserve and therefore there must be viable myocardial uh, myocytes within the subtended territory. If myocardium fails to improve throughout the entire study, then we conclude that there is no viability. But the classic uh, marker, if you like, by dobutamine stress echo of viability is this biphasic response. So you see an initial improvement followed by a worse, worsening of function. So this is some uh, multimodality uh, imaging. So on the uh, left of the screen, you have an FEG uh, PET scan of the ventricle, and uh, we call this the horizontal long axis. It's analogous to a four-chamber view in echo. The top left-hand image shows a reduction in perfusion using uh, an ammonia tracer in the apical segments. The bottom left-hand image shows FDG activity present in those areas of reduced perfusion, which from a nuclear point of view would suggest viability. The echo images demonstrate the biphasic response and so both modalities agree that with revascularization there will be an improvement or there is likely to be an improvement in LV systolic function. So these are some of the images that can be acquired with the contrast uh, echocardiography. The apex here 
pointed out to us shows normal echo contrast uh, perfusion during rest. So this is sort of similar to a first pass perfusion imaging, imaging modality, same principles. With stress, we can see a reduction in the uh, echo contrast in those apical segments. So it would look as if myocardial contrast echo is something that uh, we should be using more of clinically. But I think the, the issues have often been uh, that patients may not be very echogenic in terms of uh, image quality and a lack of uh, quantitative assessment and post-processing tools. So, on to the nuclei. So thallium as a tracer has fallen out of favour somewhat because of the increased uh, dose penalty compared to uh, Zestamibi. However, it's a, as a potassium analogue, it's actively transportable into uh, cardiomyocytes and as such it's a very uh, useful tracer to demonstrate uh, viability because obviously if the myocytes aren't viable, uh, the thallium will not enter the cells. Technetium agents like Cestamibi um, and tetraphosamine do need uh, mitochondria within the cells to be alive, to enter them passively, but thereafter the intracellular uh, use requires energy, it's active. So at the moment no spec technique can claim to be a gold standard. However, as Leon will tell you, we have PET. And PET really is uh, the gold standard for uh, myocardial viability. Well, it is in my opinion. So in order to demonstrate uh, hibernating myocardium, we need a tracer that is going to show and demonstrate the metabolic switch in hibernating myocardium from fatty acid metabolism to glucose metabolism, which is more energy efficient. And we've got that ideal tracer in FTG. So FTG uptake will show us the myocardial areas of active glucose metabolism. We then need a tracer which will show us myocardial blood flow because it's the mismatch between perfusion which we are assuming in hibernating myocardium is normal and metabolism. So this, this mismatch is key. Absence of tracer in both the perfusion tracer and the FDG tracer will tell us that this is scar tissue, this is infarction and there is no benefit in revascularizing here. And these are some rubidium PET and FTG PET images showing us that the apical septal perfusion is significantly abnormal, but there is FTG activity, so this is hibernating myocardium. And should be uh, revascularized. Some more multimodality imaging here, using CT without contrast to assess for fatty metaplasia and uh, nuclear imaging. So this was 80 patients with unenhanced CT and FDG PET uh, and the rock curve showed that the Hounsville units below 30 was the most accurate for differentiating viable and non-viable myocardium. And the bits with the arrows there is the, the fatty metaplasia, so the infarcted apex, which is demonstrated beautifully on the uh, FDG PET imaging. Some work using CT for viability, so have some experience in using CT perfusion, but not really the use of CT for viability. This is 15 patients 
uh, with known coronary disease and LV dysfunction who had a contrast CT uh, and also an FDG PET. Um, CT uh, is always good for quantitative analysis. Uh, the delayed enhancement CT is sort of getting there in terms of trying to make CT analogous to uh, late GAD imaging on CMR. And these arrows show us the same basal to mid uh, infra infralateral segments showing reduced uh, FDG uptake and scar. So CMR is now, I suppose, in most people's minds, the go-to uh, examination for assessing uh, myocardial uh, viability. You just have to be slightly careful when you're reviewing the trial evidence here because there are some anomalies. The other thing that you have to be aware of is that often the uh, extent of uh, the transmural infarction is judged visually and we know that in myocardial hi hibernation there may be uh, concomitant wall thinning. So generally, if you've lost 50% of your uh, wall thickness, you're judged to be uh, non-viable. And if it's less than 50, you're considered viable. So you can see already there's potential issues with, with using this, this threshold. Uh, and then obviously, depending on the patient's underlying associated conditions, this can again be, be more challenging. So that this is some, some old work just demonstrating which bit of the infarcted heart corresponds, corresponds to which arteries. So this is the work that was done which led to the 50% cutoff, but you'll see that uh, those areas of less than 50% infarction uh, did not always show improved systolic thickening post revascularization. Um, and also there's other uh, subsections within, within this study where there were multiple segments with no scar, which again did not uh, recover post revascularization. So there's, there's more to this than, uh, than perhaps just meets the eye. So this is a sort of plot of what's the most sensitive and what's the most specific imaging modality for determining uh, myocardial viability. As with all imaging, you've got to define your clinical question first. What is it exactly that you want to know? And then you can pick your imaging modality, the test that's most uh, likely to answer that clinical question. So you've got to uh, hone down... Um, the question really is to, is to is to what you want want to know. Talking of questions, there are, there are several unanswered questions still in the field of myocardial uh, viability. Why don't people recover following revascularization? Well, we could say it's a bad surgeon. Obviously, we won't say that, uh, but it, it might depend on the length um, that the myocardium has been hibernating for, as we discussed earlier. You know, more and more ischemic hits will lead to a degree of fibrosis and reduction in uh, um, functioning myocytes. You've then got these issues of remodeling, um, the, the periprocedural um, issues, and then post-procedural factors. Uh, so what's happened next? Have they had then another additional ischemic hit? Um, were they on optimal medical therapy? And then how do we really define the response to therapy? So we've got our clinical definitions if you look at improved uh, exercise capacity or quality of life or survival or um, uh, you know, reduction in heart failure admissions. But then we've got these imaging modalities and we can look there in much more detail at imaging biomarkers uh, and we can hone down, look at segmental functional recovery versus global functional recovery, looking at reverse remodeling. So uh, lots of 
lots of different parts to this, this question, which still remains a very important clinical question that we all encounter on a daily basis in our clinical practice. So should we revascularize viable myocardium? So there was a huge um, uh, Almond meta-analysis. Uh, they looked at 24 studies. It was over 3,000 patients. The mean ejection fraction was uh, 32%. Patients were on medical therapy only or had additional revascularization and then were assessed for their outcomes. And the follow-up duration was, was pretty good, so, you know, around two years. So these were the patients with viable and non-viable uh, myocardial segments. And for those patients who uh, were determined to have uh, viable myocardium, you can see the death rate was significantly reduced if they were, they were revascularized. In patients uh, who were determined to have non-viable myocardium, uh, there was potential to slightly increase mortality in those who were revascularized. So I think then it's the argument that we should only really revascularize patients if there is evidence of uh, viability. And this is the same data presented in a slightly different way that shows that if you have uh, patients who are just receiving optimal medical therapy and are not revascularized if they have viable myocardial segments, uh, they potentially do worse. But if we look back at these 24 studies in a bit more detail, we can see that they're all fairly old, uh, that the mean ejection fraction was, uh, the, the range of the ejection fraction was really very, very variable. Uh, a lot did not report NYHA class or um, CCS class. Uh, the studies also in included uh, PCI and um, plain old balloon uh, angioplasty, POBA. Uh, a lot of studies didn't report the vascularization details uh, and, and uh, uh, many didn't uh, reassess LV function post revascularization. Um, so we needed uh, sort of randomized controlled trials to address whether revascularization of viral myocardium improved outcome over uh, modern optimal medical therapy. So we have uh, heart, PAR2 and STITCH. So there were quite a different group of uh, trials with uh, significant difference in the number of patients who were uh, enrolled and the number of uh, sites and countries involved. And the clinical question though however was similar. So does revascularization improve outcome uh, compared to optimal medical therapy in patients with uh, evidence of hibernating myocardium? And the outcome for each of these trials was that there was no significant benefit uh, above and beyond optimal medical therapy. So now we don't tend to suggest revascularization in ischemic cardiomyopathy unless they have symptomatic angina. So in part two, uh, these clinicians within the study didn't always follow the protocol, so they reanalyzed the data and showed that those who had uh, management based on the uh, PET advice uh, did better. Those who were managed sort of ad hoc, independent of the uh, additional information available from uh, PET imaging uh, did slightly worse. So STITCH now enrolled over a decade ago, uh, coronary artery disease and poor ejection fraction. And of those patients who were enrolled, there was a uh, myocardial viability substudy of 601 patients. So at the 10-year stitch follow-up presented in 2016, those patients who'd been revascularized uh, did better in terms of uh, all-cause mortality and cardiovascular hospital hospitalizations. However, in the viability substudy, although there were improvements in myocardial function determined by imaging, there was no different in no difference in patient outcomes. So the strengths of the STITCH trial, it was multi-site, the surgeons were uh, expert with very low complication rates uh, and the vast majority of patients uh, 
remained within the trial and were not lost to follow up. In terms of the demographics, there were around 60, more than two thirds had angina, uh, more than two thirds had little uh, symptoms of congestive cardiac failure. So really there was a trial of patients with uh, coronary disease and LV dysfunction rather than heart failure syndrome patients who weren't uh, presenting in extremis with uh, pulmonary edema. There was also uh, a bias, so many centres didn't enrol patients as physicians didn't want uh, the patients being put at risk of being randomised when they felt they were better off um, to be managed in one way or another. And significant left main stem disease was excluded, so that removes a lot of the uh, probable benefits uh, for revascularisation. So in stitch, they were younger, didn't really have such bad heart failure than the patients that we would generally see in a clinical setting. So in terms of crossover, around 17% um, who were managed with optimal medical therapy ended up having coronary artery bypass grafting, and around 9 who had originally been randomised to having coronary artery bypass grafting had optimal medical therapy. Of those in the optimal medical therapy group, 6% uh, had PCI, but this was not counted as revascularisation. And uh, the core lab uh, analysis uh, showed that actually almost 20% had uh, better LV function than had been um, documented previously. So in terms of the viability substudy, uh, it's not really comparing uh, like with like, so it was non-randomised, the physicians were just left to make their own decisions, um, those that underwent viability testing had significantly larger ventricles, much lower ejection fraction, they were probably trying to make the case to, to revascularise rather than uh, cherry picking those that were, were, were more likely to, to do better. Um, all of these things make the functional recovery much less likely. The protocol was amended during the trial to add DSC as well as SPECT imaging to help recruitment. They didn't use PET or CMR. Ischemia wasn't assessed in most patients and the SPECT protocol just looked at the tracer uh, uptake uh, defect size and didn't assess the relationship between perfusion and the resting regional warmer abnormalities. So it's uh, pretty rubbish comparing apples and oranges. So, so what do we do now? So there's lots of observational data, most of which is retrospective, suggesting that revascularization is better uh, than optimal medical therapy if you've got viability. We've also all come across the uh, young patients with very poor LV uh, and three-vessel disease. So even in the absence of angina, you, you just want to revascularize. Um, We've got three prospective randomised controlled trials, each of which suggests that there's absolutely no benefit between, or no difference between optimal medical therapy and revascularisation, but each of them have, have got their own limitations. So where are we up to? Well, NICE has said that uh, coronary revascularisation should not be routinely considered in patients with heart failure due to um, LV systolic impairment unless they have refractory angina. Uh, and the ESC uh, in 2015 said that there was a class 2 level B evidence uh, of uh, revascularization if uh, myocardial viability was demonstrated. So this is work from uh, Benoit Shah, uh, published in the European Heart Journal in 2013, which gives, I think, a very pragmatic user's guide. So you have a patient with a diagnosis of ischemic cardiomyopathy, you put them on optimal medical therapy, you then determine what the major symptom is, it is, is it angina, is it dyspnea, you assess the comorbidities and risk of revascularization if the predominant symptom is angina and they have uh, relatively low procedural risks, you would recommend revascularization. If the procedural risk is high, you would aim to up-titrate uh, optimal medical therapy and consider revascularization if persistent symptoms. If the patient's predominant symptom is breathlessness, uh, if their procedural risk is high, you would aim to treat with uh, optimal medical therapy plus or minus cardiac resynchronization. And if they had persistent symptoms, you could then reconsider uh, uh, vas revascularization. If the procedural risks uh, were, meant, were thought to be low to intermediate, 
viability testing uh, would then help uh, make the uh, differential decision between revascularization and optimal medical therapy. So um, there's a few more trials still ongoing. So the alternative imaging modalities in ischemic heart failure trial, uh, image HF, this is a multi-center prospective randomized controlled trial comparing SPECT uh, versus more advanced uh, imaging modalities for myocardial uh, viability such as uh, cardiac MR and uh, PET. And they're currently recruiting, and uh, the target is over 1,000. It's a Canadian study. It's the same people who've, who did the PAR2 study. So the uh, scheme of the trial is just a patient need ischemia and or viability testing. Uh, and then if they need ischemia testing, they're randomised to standard imaging versus advanced imaging. If they need viability, again, randomised to standardised versus advanced imaging, uh, advanced imaging uh, described as uh, CMR or PET viability slash PET perfusion. There's the revived BSIS-2, which is a UK study. Patients with uh, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35%, extensive coronary disease, viability in at least four uh, dysfunctional segments. Are they suitable for PCI? And if so, uh, randomize them and optimal medical therapy versus PCI plus optimal medical therapy. So in this trial, which is PCI revascularization rather than coronary artery bypass grafting, the uh, viability can be determined on any imaging modality and there are predetermined uh, thresholds for the determination of uh, adequate viability. So, in conclusion, myocardial stunning and hibernation are points on the same spectrum. Viability is a prospective assessment of left ventricular parameters pre revascularization. Hibernation, on the other hand, is a retrospective assessment of LV function post revascularization. We all encounter stunned myocardium, it remains an issue following contemporary perfusion therapy for MI, uh, and it can contribute to post MI LV dysfunction and heart failure. And further insight into these areas may help guide novel therapies not just for ischemic cardiomyopathies but also the non ischemic cardiomyopathies. So, thank you very much for your attention, and if you do have any questions, uh, please post them below. Best wishes. Please comment below if you have any questions. If you found that interesting, please like and subscribe for more lectures. If you'd like to know more, follow the BNCS on Twitter and visit our website. Thank you.